Organs without bodies. Delos and consequences. By Slava Zizek. The cut of the gaze. About one third into Hitchcock's shadow of a doubt, there is a brief passage that fully bears witness to his genius. The young FBI detective investigating Uncle Charlie takes the latter's young niece Charlie out for a date. We see them in a couple of shots walking along the streets, laughing and talking vivaciously. Then, unexpectedly, we get a fast fade out into the American shot of Charlie in a state of shock, gaping with a transfixed gaze at the detective off screen, blurting out nervously. I know what you are really. You are a detective. Of course, we do expect the detective to use the opportunity and to acquaint Charlie with Uncle Charlie's dark side. However, what we expect is a gradual passage. The detective should first break the cheerful mood and address the serious issue, thus provoking Charlie's outburst when she realizes how she was being manipulated, the detective asked her for a date not because he liked her but as part of his professional work. Instead of this expected gradual passage, we are directly confronted with the traumatized Charlie. One could argue that, with her shocked gaze, Charlie does not react to some previous detective's words, what happened is that, in the middle of the frivolous conversation, she all of a sudden grasps that there is something other than flirting going on. However, even in this case, the standard procedure to film the scene would have been to show the couple pleasantly talking, then, all of a sudden, Charlie would be struck by the fateful insight. The key Hitchcockian effect would thus be missing, the direct jump to the shocked gaze. It is only after this shocking discontinuity that the detective voices his suspicions about Uncle Charlie's murderous past. To put it in temporal terms, it is as if, in this scene, the effect precedes its cause, that is, we are first shown the effect, the traumatized gaze, and then given the context responsible for this dramatic impact or are we? Is the relationship between cause and effect really inverted here? What if the gaze is here not merely a recipient of the event? What if it somehow mysteriously generates the perceived incident? What if the conversation that follows is ultimately an attempt to symbolize slash domesticate this dramatic incident? Such a cut in the continuous texture of reality, such a momentous inversion of the proper temporal order, signals the intervention of the real. If the scene were to be short in the linear order, first the cause, then the effect, the texture of reality would have been left undamaged. That is to say, the real is discernible in the gap between the true cause of the terrified gaze and what we are given to see later as its cause, the true cause of the terrified gaze is not what we are shown or told afterwards but the fantasized, traumatic excess projected by the gaze into the perceived reality. A more complex example of the same procedure is one of the key recurring Hitchcockian motifs, that of a couple arguing on a small hill, half barren, with a few trees and bushes, usually windy, just outside the scope of the public place populated by a group of ignorant observers. For Alain Bergala, this scene stages Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, just prior to being chased from it, in the process of tasting the forbidden knowledge. If one discounts a couple of minor references and variations, from Notorious to Topaz, there are three main versions of it, Suspicion, The Birds, and Torn Curtain. In Suspicion, it is the brief shot of Grant and Fontaine struggling on a windy hill near the church, observed by Fontaine's friend from the entrance to the church. In The Birds, it is the scene, just prior to the first bird attack on the group of children, in which Mitch and Melanie withdraw to a small hill above the picnic place where children are celebrating a birthday party. Finally, in Torn Curtain, it is the scene in which Newman and Andrews withdraw to a The cut of the gaze Small hill, out of earshot of the East German secret police officials who can only observe them there, Newman explains to his fiancée the truth about his mission. The key feature is that, in all three cases, the couple on the hill is observed by an innocent threatening ignorant observer below the hill, friends close to the church, Mitch's ex-lover and mother, East German secret policeman, respectively, who sees only the scene and is unable to discern the meaning of the intense exchange of the observed couple. The traumatic character of the scene, the excess of the real that pertains to it, hinges on this gaze, it is only from the standpoint of this gaze that the scene is traumatic. When, 
later, the camera jumps closer to the couple, the situation is again normalized. Bergala is right to emphasize how the scene reproduces the basic coordinates of the child's primordial sexual encounter, witnessing the parents' lovemaking, unable to decide what the scene he sees is, violence or love. The problem of his account is simply that it appears all too close to the standard archetypal reading, trying to identify the kernel of the meaning of the scene instead of conceiving of it as a meaningless sent home. The fundamental lesson of this procedure is that there is more truth in this misperception by the partial gaze than in the objective, true state of things. This gap is rendered palpable by the phantasmatic opening scene of Bojest, William Wellman, the classic Hollywood adventure melodrama from 1939, the mysterious desert fortress in which there is no living person, only dead soldiers placed on its walls, a true desert counterpart to the specter of the ship floating around without any crew. Toward its end, Bojest renders the same sequence from within the fortress, namely, it depicts how this haunting image of the fortress with dead soldiers was generated. The key point here is the excess of the scene of illusory appearance, its libidinal force overpowers its later rational explanation. The notion of sacrifice usually associated with Lacanian psychoanalysis is that of a gesture that enacts the disavowal of the impotence of the big other, at its most elementary, the subject offers his sacrifice not to profit from it himself but to fill in the lack in the other, to sustain the appearance of the other's omnipotence or, at least, consistency. In Bojest, the elder of the three brothers, Gary Cooper, living with their benevolent aunt, in what seems to be a gesture of excessive, ungrateful cruelty, steals the enormously expensive diamond necklace that is the pride of the ant's family. He disappears with it, knowing that his reputation is ruined, that he will be forever known as the ungracious embezzler of his benefactress. So, why did he do it? At the end of the film, we learn that he did it to prevent the embarrassing disclosure that the necklace was a fake. Unbeknownst to everyone else, he knew that, some time ago, the ant had to sell the necklace to a rich Maharaja to save the family from bankruptcy, and she replaced it with a worthless imitation. Just prior to his theft, he learned that a distant uncle who co-owned the necklace wanted it sold for financial gain, if the necklace were to be sold, the fact that it is a fake would undoubtedly be discovered. Consequently, the only way to retain the ants, and, thus, the families, honor is to stage its theft. This is the proper deception of the crime of stealing, to occlude the fact that, ultimately, there is nothing to steal this way, the constitutive lack of the other is concealed, i.e., the illusion is maintained that the other possessed what was stolen from it. If, in love, one gives what one does not possess, in a crime of love, one steals from the beloved other what the other does not possess the bojest of the film's title alludes to precisely this. And therein also resides the meaning of sacrifice, one sacrifices oneself, one's honor and future in respectful society, to maintain the appearance of the other's honor, to save the beloved other from shame. One cannot but take note of the strange echo between the two false appearances, the fortress with dead soldiers, i.e., with no one to defend it, and the other fortress, the English home with no real wealth sustaining it, the stone on which the family fortune rests being a fake. This brings us to the opposition of the two communities, the warm English upper-class family home dominated by a woman versus the all-male foreign legion community dominated by the fascinating figure of the sadistic, but militarily very efficient, Russian Sergeant Markov, in the novel by Percival Christopher Wren, on which the movie is based, he is a Frenchman named Lejeune in a displacement typical of the late 1930s, the evil character was russified, although, in a politically interesting way. The Phi LM hints that Markov must be a white Russian counter-revolutionary émigré. The two communities, of course, are equivalent, two sides of the same coin, of the suspended normal paternal authority. One is even tempted to claim that Sir Hector Brandon, the bad husband of the good Aunt Patricia, who is always away from home, looking for adventures in exotic countries, is libidinally equivalent to the evil Markov. And does the same not also apply to Hitchcock's Vertigo? Like Bojest, the focus of Vertigo is on creating the perfect semblance, which is then explained away. 
Furthermore, the whole point is that, when we learn the true story, the first part of the movie, until Madeline's suicide, is not simply explained away as a fake there is more truth in the appearance than in the true story behind it. Truth has the structure of a fiction, which is why we often pay the price for getting involved in a fake appearance in flesh, by death. Playing with appearances is playing with fiery. This is why the crucial question of vertigo is but how real is Elster? Like the judge in Kieslowski's Red, is Elster not, as to his libidinal status, the fantasy product of the hero's imagination? This fits well into the reading of Vertigo as a film that plays on two registers. On the one hand, it is a carefully crafted yarn, the story of the character, Scotty, of what happens to him, and of how he responds, located in a when the fantasy falls apart. Detailed and recognizable California environment. On the other hand, it is famously dreamlike both in its texture and in the way it introduces story and protagonist. Echoing Robin Wood, James Maxfield argues that everything after the opening sequence is dream or fantasy. In the second reading, the structure is the one of Ambrose Bierce's famous short story An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, in which everything that follows the hanging of a man at the story's outset is, at the end, revealed as the fantasy of the dying man. This structure is also recognizable in films like Point Blank, which is often read as depicting the fantasy of the mortally wounded Lee Marvin. The crucial point here is to identify what Delos would have called the dark precursors, the non-repeated, unique elements that, precisely insofar as they belong only to one level, serve as the bridge, mediator, or point of passage between the two. The point is not so much to identify the stand-in for reality within fantasy, like, in Vanilla Sky, the doctor from real life who appears within the hero's digitally generated universe to warn him, but, rather, to identify the stand-in for the illusory mental universe within reality itself. The gap and, simultaneously, link between the two levels is rendered palpable in the mysterious moments of the perfect timing of the interrupting intrusion of the third agency. In the pivotal and, perhaps, most beautiful scene of the film, that of Scotty and Madeline in his apartment, after he saves her from drowning under the Golden Gate Bridge, as their talk grows more intimate, Scotty offers to get her more coffee, and reaches for her cup, their hands touch, and we can see, within a two-shot, that for both of them this is a moment of erotic tension and possibility. Immediately, the phone rings, the tension is broken, and Scotty leaves the room to answer it. When he returns, she has gone. The call is, of course, from Elster, and its timing is uncannily precise, to the second, allowing them to get so far but no further. At the film's end, the nun appears in the tower at the very moment Scotty and Judy embrace in a reconciliation, with Scotty content to accept the reality of Judy, what if the nun had not appeared, at the moment when, for the very first time, they are being completely open and honest with each other. Would they live happily ever after?